And today we have an exciting presentation focusing on um, using high content imaging uh, for uh, ligand discovery and characterization. It is hosted by uh, Stefan Prechel. I'm pleased to present uh, him to you. Um, he has much experience in the pharmaceutical industry um, using uh, these kinds of methods, his degrees in biology uh, and PhD in immunology, um, using high content imaging, including automated uh, image analysis, analysis machine learning approaches. He worked for many years in, this, in uh, industrial research at Sharing Bayer Nubison, and most recently he um, uh, founded um, Salima, which offers a specialized range of scientific services in this area. Um, so we're going to hear, um, based on his great experience and uh, with a couple of colleagues, about um, high content imaging in chemical probe and drug discovery. Stefan? Many thanks, Charlie, for this kind introduction. Um, just share my desktop. Yeah. Can you see the, the video of the presentation? Wonderful. So yeah, it's it's a really great pressure. I, pre, I really sorry. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and to guide our audience uh, and the interested viewers through this webinar as a moderator with this uh, very exciting topic of high content imaging. But before we get to the actual presentation, it's my pleasure now to give a brief overview of the exciting topic. And um, in this overview, I will briefly discuss the four pillars on which I think well-functional high-content imaging rests. These are microscopy, cell biology, image analysis, and the interplay of laboratory technology and skilled information technology to process, analyze, and evaluate the data you collect with your images. So let's start with microscopy, which is a complex technology that is required to, and the complex technology that is required to ensure that stable data can be reproduced at any time and can be collected and made available for analysis. We have four categories of equipment available with which we can automatically collect images of cells and provide them for automated image analysis. On the one hand, these four device categories represent the history of device development, but on the other hand, these readers also occupy a different niche of research dependent uses. With motorized microscopes, it was possible for the first time to control randomized positions of sample containers or even smaller microtiter plates. However, these microscopes were still designed and optimized for manual operation. True high content imaging with these devices can only be performed with great effort for very small selected samples. And with the next stage, which are converted and reshaped automated microscope, 96 wheel plates could also be processed and the high content approach could be implemented for a larger number of samples, especially since such automated microscopes can already be combined with an automated plate feeding system. But real screening of several thousand samples can only be achieved by investing in systems that have been designed from the ground up for fully automated use and allow real 24 seven operation without one person having to check the run all the time. This high content imaging readers are true screening machines and can reliably measure millions of samples. However, in this category, this is only possible through extended reading times. When we compare the reading times to standard approaches like standard cell-based assays and uh, biochemistry assays. But with the latest generation of readers, a new master now has been reached. And these new reading machines with reduced footprint provide an improved efficiency and achieve reading speeds in high content imaging screening that can match the throughput of standard cell assays and biochemical assays. With these latest generation devices, complex phenotypic multi-parametric screening has become affordable and feasible in a reasonable time. In addition to well-designed technological equipment, a functional cell biology laboratory is crucial for a high content imaging facility that reliably supports medical research. This ensures that the most suitable cell model for the research purpose is available and ready for sample testing at all times. In a well-functioned high content imaging laboratory, cell models are available at different levels of difficulty. These can be simple functional assays that test individual parameters, on the one hand, but it is likely that multi-parametric assays 
And the principle of these essays, which are addressing specific metabolic questions or essays designed to test the effect of a specific ligand on a specific target will be required much more frequently. And such essay approaches can then be tested using established annotated cell models or can be tested with primary cell system from patients or even with mixed cellular populations in 2D culture or in complex three-dimensional spheroidal microtumors or organoids. And all of this is necessary and must be able to be provided in a functioning high content imaging laboratory in order to use high content imaging technology to its full potential and to provide the best possible service for medical research. Now that we have talked about the hardware in the broadest sense, the reading devices and the cell models, let's move on the software. The way we analyze the images determines how efficiently we will support medical research with our high content imaging approach. Again, there are different analysis models available, best suited for each research approach. For training purposes and for marking training data sets, the simple pick, collect, and count approach still works very well. But with image segmentation, pattern recognition, and up to the complex deep learning approach, we have tools now available for conventional image analysis, or we can use artificial intelligence to analyze data efficiently and appropriately, depending on the complexity of the data that have been acquired with the imaging devices. The right choice of tool is crucial for the efficiency of the support we can provide to medical research. And the right interplay of fully automated robotic high resolution microscopy with fully automated Image analysis, which is supported by machine learning approaches, is crucial in the high content imaging workflow. With the perfectly coordinated interplay of these components, it is possible to ensure that this technology can reliably make a decisive contribution to research. And this includes also the right choice of cell model and essay approach, as well as the clever selection of the model of the method that is used to analyze the raw data, the images that have been acquired. When this interplay of the various components that make up high content imaging technology works well, then high content imaging can make a decisive contribution as a versatile tool in medical research. The potential applications in medical research are enormous. They are ranging from large scale primary screening of large substance libraries and rapid endpoint measurements in 2D routine cell cultures up to complex analysis of spatiotemporal changes represented in complex 3D organoids consisting, for instance, of patient-derived cell models. Reliable and efficient analysis of such complex cell biology relationships works primarily because we now have relatively accessible machine learning methods that can be used in high content imaging to, anal to analyze these complex relationships. And with this, I want to thank you for listening to this brief overview. And I'm now looking forward to hand over to the colleagues from DC and E who will present their exciting data from their high content imaging experiments. Our first speaker is Eugenio Fava, who heads the core facility and services at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, DC and E. Um, he is an enthusiastic scientist with experience in neuroscience and drug discovery, and his goal is to bring laboratory scale research to an industrial standard for preclinical drug discovery using innovative platforms being built in this group. Eugenio will give us an overview on the uh, research strategies and uh, on the um, CNS related research in his group. And our second speaker is Philip Denner. He is the head of the core facility for laboratory automation technologies at the DCNE, and uh, this core facility is now in place since 2010. And Philip and his team have built up a state of the art automated screening platform, which can provide screening services for small molecule libraries, but also for genome wide screening of SI RNA libraries and screening of micro RNA libraries. He will give us an introduction in the workflow of high content imaging at the DCNE and this group. And the third, third speaker is Miguel Fernandez who is the service manager of the image and data in analysis facility. He and his team provide service and support for all issues that are related to image analysis, data processing, and statistic. And they also develop their own image analysis solution, which are based on the machine learning approaches. And um, Miguel will give us an insight in the work of these machine learning approaches for high content imaging uh, at the labs of the DCNE. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Eugenio, who is the first speaker in this round. 
Yeah, Chenna, it's yours. You're still muted, I guess. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. It's fine. You should be Perfect. able to hear me now. So I'll try to share my screen. You should be able now to see. So first of all, thank you and uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, to Stefan for the kind introduction. Um, as Stefan was mentioning, I'm working at the DZNE. Uh, this is uh, a German-wide center for neurodegenerative disease in 10 different locations. We are based in Bonn and I joined the DZNE in 2009. Um, I agree with Stefan on the pillars. Uh, although I think there is a fifth pillar on the fourth, that is the team. Um, and uh, you need really a good team to work and to deliver this kind of uh, high-end technology. And I'm lucky to have really a nice team. And those are the people that has been uh, um, important for this work that I, we are presenting today. You will see Miguel and Philip. So Miguel is here and Philip is here. And, but we have a large team and everybody that is written here has contributed really to the development of what we are showing today. So now, uh, what we are doing at the DZTNE. The DZTNE is a center that is focusing mainly on central nervous disease. And uh, our major uh, core is, is to transfer what we have from the lab bench to a cure, to try to really uh, cure Alzheimer, Parkinson, and other neurodegenerative diseases. So what we do, we facilitate the transfer of the research that is done at the ZNE. At the moment, we have 86 group leaders. That means we try to talk to them and try to, to bring what is at the lab bench scale to a screening platform. And we are fully equipped with our uh, screening at the ZNE. So we have a full-fledged screening and, and uh, we have from a set development to uh, end of data analysis. And we also collaborate with the industry. Uh, at the moment, there are two major collaboration, one with the ISI, the other with ChemDiv, to bring then uh, the discovery that we do in our institute to, uh, to really end drug development. And I think this is also a very important task to have this academia industry relation, uh, because uh, I think that it is a win-win situation and we see that uh, it's really working nicely. Um, we are fully fledged with our uh, screening platform. So there is uh, Vera Roth actually that is mainly in charge of assay development. So we have, we take the, the assay from the bench scale, but then we transform in an automated assay. We validate the assay. Uh, we totally go for robustness and everything. And then Philip that you will see later is in charge of, uh, on the whole screening uh, with the team. Uh, that means we fully automated the, our robotic and everything is going to be. And then at the end of there is what I call data science, um, where Miguel uh, is applying really high-end algorithms uh, to analyze the data that we produce. And the data that we produce are quite complex data you will see later. Uh, we had two major driver activities, more molecules. Uh, where we have uh, also uh, a grant from the Helmholtz Validation Fund uh, called the Immunex, um, where we made major focus on chemistry, but we have also activity in biologic, specifically in antibody derived by uh, human patients. And this is a project in collaboration with Berlin, uh, with Harald Bruce, that is a clinician in the Charité. And uh, Bauba, we, we produce and automate the production of antibody, and we try to generate library for screening of biologics. Uh, why deep phenotype, and why what we call deep phenotype actually, and you will see probably later a bit more about the deep phenotype. I think that this is the audience. Uh, when I, I when I became aware of the target 2035. I was thinking myself, this is a very ambitious target because I mean, what we are trying to tackle is this situation here. So we have now around 20,000 genes that have been discovered, around 100,000 transcripts. And there has been uh, an estimation that there are different uh, proteoforms. That means a splicing variant, a different uh, phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, whatever it is in the decoration of the proteins that is reach 1 million. So technically, what we have is one million targets. And uh, at the moment, uh, I think there are very good tools to, to analyze these, uh, these targets. I mean, we have genomics, we have transcriptomics, we have proteomics, but we have also metabolomics and dataomics in the area. 
And despite that we have the knowledge of all this complexity in the biology, this is the situation. And this is a review that was done a few years ago, a very good review, where they analyzed how many targets we have uh, from the food and drug approved drug that are available at the moment in the market. And if you make the sum of the human proteins plus other human biomolecules, you are around 700. Now, that's a big gap to close in 12 and a half year, but I think I like ambitious goals and I think this is a very good, good goal to tackle. But anyway, I think that the classical approach in this case uh, are not working or, or working, but they are too slow if you want to increase the drugability of our proteome. And uh, if you look on disease areas, what you see, I mean, for example, this is the neurology area. There is very little. I mean, everything is more or less in antidepressant. There is some drugs for the Parkinson that is in here. There is nothing for Alzheimer or Huntington or any other things. So especially in our sector, we are in dire. Different is cancer or uh, immunology. There is much more developed. But not all the areas are targeted in the same way from the drug that are present on the market. And there are still a lot of work to do. And I think that we can uh, shape up uh, our uh, goal by using more phenotype. And then I come, I mean, as I told you, there are already techniques that analyze the things. But if I want to make an analogy with the car industry, actually, these tools give us a very fine description of the single element, like uh, the engine, like um, other parts of the car, or the cabling of the car. Of course, I mean, this is a very rough analogy, but if you want to understand uh, how the car works, this will help you to understand how the single component of the car works, but definitely you will not get a phenotype and understanding how the complexity of this machinery is working because you need something like that. And then you have to start to, to explore this one. And on top of this one, you have to put this one in the right environment. That means that you have to understand what is doing the car, who is, who is interacting with the car, how the car can be broken and can be repaired, which kind of energy and everything else. I mean, in the uh, cell models are not much different. So if you want to understand the disease, you have to understand what's going on. And the, to, to understand what is going on, you need the system. And uh, the biological space, as we define, is major entity is the cell. So at the moment, what we are doing, we are using really uh, close to the patient approach. So we use largely human primary cells or human IPS cells derived cells. And we try to limit the use of cell line, even if there is still a value. But we think that this, the cell is the perfect system to integrate all the information that we have, because in this system, all the omics, for example, interact with each other. So you have all the genetic information, you have all the RNA transcript information, you have the proteins and the interaction between the proteins within a system and not in an isolated way. And this can facilitate to discover new targets, definitely. On top of this one, we can integrate clinical data because if you work with human primary cells, you can use patient cells, and then you can also have an indication of what from the clinicians, uh, the phenotype and the data that are there. But you can also add additional information to the, to the deep phenotype like lifestyle or even environmental, like your food or diet or anything that is uh, particularly related to special disease or special patients or special condition. And we think that this approach by integrating not only the, uh, the screening data from obtained by the cell system, but also different data at the human family they can generate a deep phenotype that will help us to understand more and to make better development of drugs and discover new targets as well as new molecular mechanism of action. Now, so our approach, of course, we start from a population and we stratify our population and Philip probably will explain to you later a bit better the concept of stratification. But in principle, what we do, we take our uh, human cell models, what we call, and we generate an in vitro disease model. Um, sometimes from the certification, you can also already discover some novel targets coming up from the study of the specific cell and the specific disease. And when we have our uh, in, the in vitro disease model, we start our phenotypic screening. So we have the full automation and then we generate a phenotypic rescue. So we have a signature and uh, probably Miguel will show you more in depth what it means a phenotypic signature, but practically we collect a lot of different features from our cells 
and we can characterize the disease phenotype and we can try to revert the disease phenotype to a normal phenotype. And once we've done this one, we started the lead generation and then we can go back to our patients and what we call in vitro patient tests. So we can now take three, four, five, six specific uh, uh, patients the right material, and we can try to see if the drug that we have, the it lead that we have generate, is applying to a more generic population rather than a single individual. This is also a very important step because uh, by a recent uh, review as well, uh, it's been demonstrated that uh, the majority of the drugs that are in the FDA catalog work on 50% of the population, and that's also something to bear in mind. Um, and then you can go, of course, in clinical phase that we at the moment not doing, but we would like to develop also our clinical course. We have clinical course, but we don't have it clinical studies, but we do normally this one in collaboration with uh, uh, pharma industry. And then, of course, you go through the phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. And this can accelerate the discovery and be more relevant and more successful, hopefully, especially for CNS. Um, yeah, there is a small example case. So we are working at the moment a lot in innate immunity and the relation of innate immunity in neurodegeneration. Um, we obtain uh, PBNC from, uh, from donors, LT donors or, or patients, but we have also integration of uh, IPS derived cells in our assay. And what we do, we combine the eye content phenotype, but also we combine homogeneous readout, and then all the data go through the machine learning analysis that Miguel will show you later. And then we are trying to understand with the deep data analysis, what kind of molecules are interacting with uh, the, the phenotype and at which level of the phenotype we are interacting. In this case, we can also try to understand the, the molecular mechanism of action, but also the target eventually by the, the interaction of the pathway. Uh, this is an example. So those are PBNC untreated. We stimulate our uh, immune system in different ways. So we are not using only the basal status, but we also uh, trigger the immune system to react. And as you can appreciate, you have already different phenotype. Now this different phenotype can be characterized by using this feature description signature. And this is our base of phenotype. Those are the relevant disease phenotype. And then we can try to correct back by using small drugs uh, or more molecules to, to the original phenotype or to generate a different phenotype and that's trying to understand what it's all about. Um, the features are describe a lot of parameters that we can stretch from the images like intensity, topology, uh, morphology, texture of different markers. And this is a very long vector that is used then in the analysis to generate uh, highly effective evaluation of our drugs, but also to predict the MOA and also eventually to try to de-risk the drug from the very beginning. And this is also a, a very strong advantage is when you use uh, eye content approach because and phenotype approach, because you can really try to understand if your drug is differentiated from the concurrence and if it's safe already at the beginning of the drug discovery. And we can use other methods to verify the phenotype, of course. Um, Practically what we have, it is an I-dimensional multivariate feature extraction. We do a feature selection in the data analysis, and then we do our deep phenotype analysis. And this is done all with what we call data science. So we have very large data set. We use classification, we use machine learning to analyze and uh, uh, make statistics. And at the end, we generate new knowledge that then is a feedback in the loop all the time. There is a phenotype signal generation for each of the of the cells that, uh, that I show you, and this is used in our uh, in our laboratories. And we try to integrate also our data. This is also very important. So if you want to develop a new method using artificial intelligence uh, approaches like machine learning or deep learning, it is important that your algorithm can feed the different data and not all the data are compatible to each other. So, and not all the algorithm can work with all the data. Um, we, in addition to our cellular phenotypic signature, of course, we add also our chemistry data, there are omics data that we add, but also clinical data, or other existing data from other laboratories, or any other data that is coming up in the future, we would like to be able to add in our, in our algorithms. And that's why by doing this one, we think that we can generate 
uh, not only the use of the biological space, the chemical space, and the multi-omics uh, approach, and also clinical data and other things to generate the, oops, sorry, uh, no, I went too far. Um, I had to go back to the things. So practically the use of all this, this information and the integration of this information uh, can help us then to generate what we call it the, our output. So not only for the lead compound discovery, but also for target discovery, adverse effect or the molecular maximum infection detection. And finally, of course, there are problems. If you work with primary cells, uh, one of the challenges that you have in front of you that if you have a population and you stamp your population, each of the donor is a bit different from the others. So if I take my PBNC now, or if I take the PBNC from Miguel and Philip now, of course we have variation, but for doing this one, we tackle the problem in a different way. So we took a population, a reference population, and we analyzed the PBNC by using our deep phenotype, make generation of signature for each of the donors, and then put everything in a database. And we have around 500 donors at the moment, divided by LT donors and disease donors. And then we use this, when you take a new population that is completely different from the first population, to analyze individual or subgroup of this population and then make deep phenotype on them and reference them to our database. And we know if there is high responder, middle responder, low responder, and we can tell exactly which of the samples represent a population. And this is an advantage in our, in our end. Um, and with this one, I thank you already. And I think that then I pass my, uh, to my colleague, probably Philip is in the next one. And I had one share and did I share? Yes, you did. <laughs> Good. Okay, then I will try. So I will take over and I will try at first to share my screen. Can you see the screen, the slide? And the cursor? Okay, perfect. Perfect. So, also from my side, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening uh, to all of you, depending on which location you will attend the seminar. It's uh, a pleasure for me to share our approach to look uh, to the immune system for drug discovery. And I'm here to present more or less the front end. Uh, that means uh, the concept, the essay, the data logistics to set up a reliable technology for high content screening to probe ligand binding. So let's start uh, with, our, with our target or what it's all about. That means that the inflammasome uh, is a key mechanism in inflammatory diseases. And uh, the inflammasome uh, itself uh, that uh, uh, responds uh, to a wide range of infectious and endogenous, um, sorry, I cannot see here something. So. No, I see my slide. Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, to to a wide range of infectious endogenous ligands, uh, and it's implicated in many different kind of diseases uh, of several auto-inflammatory diseases, including arthritis, gout, diabetes, obesity, and in our case, where we are focusing on in our uh, dementia, that means Alzheimer's disease, or, uh, Parkinson's disease, and and so on. Um, and in all these diseases, as a hub, there are uh, special cell types involved uh, in the innate immune response. These are uh, macrophages and uh, depend on the diseases, it's tissue related macrophages. In the case of uh, the brain diseases, it's the microglial cell or uh, the monocytes in the blood. So this is a little bit simplified uh, because uh, nowadays there are, uh, are more uh, cells cell types are known, which uh, can mount in the inflammasome and to, um, to, to trigger uh, the innate immune response to, to a signal. But just for this case, we will keep it a little bit simplified uh, with these uh, three cell types. So, and uh, what's all about, it's the in, in, innate immune response. It's the first line of uh, host defense. And uh, here, as special proteins, special sensors, or pattern recognition receptors are involved, which uh, react on um, 
uh, in response to, to harmful stimuli. And uh, these are pattern recognition receptors, or shortly PRRs. And uh, these receptors in these uh, cell types recognize the presence of uh, microbial uh, components called pathogenic associated molecular patterns or PEMPs or damage associated molecular patterns, DAMs, uh, which are generated then by uh, the, the environment uh, or uh, endogenous stress uh, uh, in their surrounding tissue. And uh, by triggering uh, these receptors, a complete uh, big uh, signal cascade is uh, activated and uh, their, uh, the inflammasome itself is um, assembled in these cells. And their inflammasome itself is a huge protein um, complex, uh, which um, consists of the PRRs, uh, adapter proteins, and uh, all of them are oligomerized in the cell and they form a platform for procaspase one uh, activation in the response of these dumps and pumps. And at, at the moment, or currently, uh, at least five members of the PRRs uh, were identified and confirmed to form inflammasomes. This is not an RP1, an RP3, this is very prominent at the moment, and an RC4, M2, and pyrin. And when uh, we look a little bit more in detail which mechanisms are involved in uh, this uh, immune re response, then we have uh, here um, uh, this kind of pathway here. Yeah? The activation of the inflammasome in macrophages, microglia or monocytes requires two steps. Uh, this is highly regulated uh, pathway and uh, as you have seen the sketch from Argenio in, uh, in his presentation, then this is a really complex regulated uh, signaling cascade. And here uh, I show you also just a more simplified uh, version of it. So um, <clears throat> everything um, starts with uh, the first signal. This is a priming step um, <clears throat> provided by inflammatory stimuli uh, in, uh, in the extracellular space, which uh, then triggers the TOLAC receptor. Uh, and uh, by that inducing the nf kappa b mediated protein expression would make the cell in the first step competent to react on a second activation signal, <clears throat> which is then triggered by uh, these kind of PAMPs or DAMPs, uh, which I uh, have introduced before, and uh, thereby promoting the uh, PRR inflammasome assembly, the Caspase one mediated uh, cleavage then of uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines like IL-1 beta or IL-18 secretion. <clears throat> so all to, taking all this together, there's a very interesting signaling pathway, I think. And uh, you can consider, of course, when you now look from uh, a, uh, 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 an essay development uh, uh, perspective that you consider can consider different steps to measure a modulating effect of a drug yeah, or a ligand. And in fact, these are, uh, modulators of inflammasome activation are of really great interest for, for therapeutic intervention in many different diseases. We concentrate, uh, we, are concent we are focusing on the uh, um, ZNS diseases, but uh, their overall mechanism is true for all these other uh, diseases as well. But how to set up such a screening assay? Eh? Um, at first, you have to, to choose uh, for the screening as in which organism uh, you can uh, take. Yeah? All of them have different advantages. You can take cell lines from rodents or primary cells from rodents or non human primates or uh, as in our case, or uh, in the case for, for, uh, from, from human. Then you can think about which cell type you can use, yeah, microglia, monocytes, or other tissue-related macrophages. Um, do you use primary cells or cell lines? All have different advantages, of course. Uh, if you go for an image-based approach or homogeneous readout, because I already introduced that intracellular pathways within the cell are uh, important, but also they release cytokines and you can uh, measure also a homogeneous readout. And then of course, if you go for a mono or multi readout, 
And in our case, as Ordino already introduced, uh, uh, we are choosing uh, to use the human itself uh, as the organism because uh, we are targeting human and diseases. And um, <clears throat> it's now really known that especially the innate immunity um, is different from, from rodents or non-human primates. It's different from humans. There was a nice publication in Nature Immunology, I think, a few weeks ago by Taninen et al., uh, where they show that if you perform studies targeting human innate immune response, but performed these in animal models, that this really can uh, result in, in misleading conclusions and unpredictable clinical outcome. And this was uh, in the case study uh, with uh, oligonucleotide therapeutics, that means mRNA-based uh, vaccines. And uh, it's a really nice uh, story that they uh, show uh, how uh, human and animals um, have different innate immune systems. Then as a hub, we choose for our uh, approach the monocytes because uh, we go for primary cells, that means uh, PBMCs directly isolated uh, from, from human uh, individuals, from uh, human donors. And we think thought that uh, we have to take all the readouts, the image-based readouts, but also the homogeneous readouts because they're important and combine it at the end uh, both uh, uh, readout approaches. And by that, we, are, we choose our uh, multi-parametric readout, of course. Okay, that's all how it begins. So uh, we take a, a probant, we isolate, uh, we take blood from this probant and isolate the PBMCs. The PBMC itself, now it's also already a complex um, cell model because it's not a homotypical cell model, now consisting just of, from one cell type, but it's a heterotypical uh, cell model. That means we have not just monocytes, but also um, T cells, B cells, neutrophils, all kind of other um, of these blood cells. And uh, we um, decided not to separate them into monotypical uh, cell models, but to keep them together because we think that uh, these cells can interact uh, with each other and this might be important uh, at the end uh, for uh, the essay. So here you see systematically uh, how the essay uh, was set up. So everything starts with the PBMCs coming from a donor. Um, then we apply uh, the, uh, the first priming signal and activating the toll-like receptor pathways. Then uh, you can, for example, add uh, a drug um, and uh, to, to test the effect of this drug on uh, the inflammasome activation afterwards. Yeah, and these are, we, uh, we define as test conditions uh, that uh, you apply to the assay. And as a readout, you have the supernatant. Uh, it's a homogeneous readout. It's not a readout uh, on single cell level, but coming from a complete well. That means uh, from the monocytes, T cells, and from the complete cellular response. And of course, uh, you have then, uh, we fix the cells and do the staining, and then we have the single cell uh, analysis of all these cells uh, and how they respond to uh, the activation of the innate immune response and how the drug is modulating uh, a complete effect. And uh, we have here in our lab a special environment where we were able to fully automate these more than 20 steps of SCPLAC processing quite, uh, uh, reliable. And uh, at the end, we are not testing just one condition, but more than one condition. And uh, we ex extract then uh, from each well um, more than 1,000 test features that we can analyze at the end. But how we can automate this? Uh, so we have a special screening platform, as Eugenio already introduced uh, in the beginning. And uh, this is a very complex uh, screening platform, but uh, yeah, we have here different pipe headers uh, uh, integrated. That means uh, 96 channel head, 380 channel head, 8 channel heads, that's so I5 and I7. We have uh, all these kind of dispensers. We have an echo integrated for compound dispensing. We have all the incubators needed uh, to, uh, uh, for all the kind of incubation steps. 
We have uh, the plate reader for all the homogeneous readouts. We have their state of the art uh, high content screening images. These are the Cell Voyager 8000. We have two of them uh, integrated, and everything is connected by uh, two robotic arms. So, this is a very complex uh, um, automation. Um, but uh, it really produces re uh, uh, reliable results and robust results over now uh, really months and years. Yeah? But when you think about automate an essay, the instrumentation is nowadays not all because um, <clears throat> when you think about the, the essay, yeah? you have a lot of information that you have to collect uh, during the essay play processing. Yeah? Every starts. Everything starts with a donor. You have a lot of information of the donor, if it's a patient, if it's a healthy uh, person, uh, the height, uh, the weight, uh, their, uh, if it's a female or male um, donor, um, if it's um, and which age um, is it, and so on and so on. So here we can have a lot of metadata. We have all the essay information, all the incubation times, all the detailed essay plate processing. Uh, information that we collect, um, or the compound information as well. Then we have all the raw data, homogeneous raw data, and image raw data information. And uh, when you really uh, run um, a, a process like this over months and years, then it's really, really key that uh, you harmonize uh, all these data, the metadata and the raw data. And for this, we uh, developed uh, a software package uh, based on Python. We call it Cobra. Uh, it's fully automated. It integrates, aggregates, and pre-process all the raw data and all the information that comes along uh, with essay um, processing. Uh, it, uh, um, it checks. Uh, it is doing quality control and visualization. And with these two automation pipelines, yeah, you then are really able to do at the end also the deep phenotyping yeah? uh, when you have all the data frames in a very uh, harmonized, uh, produced in a very harmonized way. So what's uh, taken together? Yeah? Um, we, at, at least the essay, yeah? the essay translates uh, the individual innate, uh, innate immune response into a feature vector. That's what, what we are doing. And then you, as Eugenio already described, that then you can uh, see what is, uh, you, you can compare a reference feature vector with a drug induced feature vector. But uh, when you are working really with reference, uh, uh, with primary cells coming from individuals, then what is exactly a reference vector, right? Because you can then ask, different question, huh? what is a reference donor? Huh? Uh, how many donors do I need to uh, have a, a representative sample? Uh, do I have all the metadata and uh, which metadata is really available of these donors? Because we are working uh, with primary uh, cells. And to, to solve this issue, uh, we, we, we thought to go back one step and see uh, how to better understand uh, what is really uh, the population-related phenoprofiles uh, in the innate immune response. And for that, we uh, collected individuals according to the distribution of their um, US population. Uh, uh, and we started with 18 years old individuals uh, to 60 or even 80 years old. And um, we collected all the PBMCs coming from these individuals and um, tried to understand uh, which effect of, for example, the age has on the innate immune response, really to better understand uh, what, uh, um, what, what is their um, innate, um, innate immune response of a target population or target subgroup. Uh, and uh, we collected uh, at the moment more than 200 different individuals, and this is a growing database, and we put all the information phenom profiles into our database. Then we have different patients because we are interested, are there disease-related phenotypes in the innate immune response? And uh, just one example, it's obese versus non-obese. Uh, uh, this is also a disease, um, and uh, their uh, obesity has an effect on um, 
the innate immune response and um, uh, we, we try to, 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 to uh, detect and to analyze disease-related phenoprofiles. And we collected more than uh, phenoprofiles that of more than 300 patients. And of course, last but not least, we uh, did a lot of screening. So uh, we have bioactive and diverse compound collections. Um, and uh, oh, and we, we, we screened over 10,000 drugs. Uh, to really analyze uh, the drug-induced phenom profiles. And uh, with that, um, um, yeah, and we, we, we store everything in the database. So, and this is now the front end of our approach, I would say. Um, and I introduced to which parts of the assay itself, the assay processing and all the background knowledge we consider to be important for reliable data analysis strategy and re reliable conclusions. Yeah, and uh, with that, which kind of question we can ask and how we can work then with this kind of database, uh, I will hand over to part three of their uh, seminar and to my colleague Miguel Fernandez. So thank you very much. And I just will hand over. Thank you very much, Philip, and your journey, of course, and uh, welcome you all today show you presentation. Hope you can all see my presentation. Yeah, so I will focus today on the an analysis part um, that relates to the deep phenotyping. And um, I will only give you a glimpse of what we are doing here, of course, and I will keep it general enough so you, because we have different applications running in the, in the Institute. So, yeah, so um, if you, as a, at the broad level, this uh, deep phenotyping is an image-based profiling, um, and you can think about um, having cells where you apply a particular treatment and uh, the morphology, texture, other kinds of features are changing. Um, if you think about uh, applying compounds, and uh, Philip showed you nicely how um, he has um, integrated a very, um, um, high contact screening, it's image-based contact screening um, for this approach. So we have multiple wells and in it from which well you can extract multiple features. And uh, I'm very um, I'm happy that I'm joined of course by talented data scientists and uh, the work I'm going to show today is um, done mainly by uh, Pranjal Dol. Um, the work um, that we develop is, uh, is, is, is called deep phenotyping. It's a robust image-based profiling strategy that uses an open source tool called Cell Profiler from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And um, there is a couple of uh, laboratories in the world that are using this, uh, this tool. And with this tool, we are collecting more than 1,500 features. Although I have to say we went a bit further than uh, what, is, what uh, is done in other laboratories, we developed custom plugins for extracting additional features um, that are relevant for phenotyping um, complex data. And we are focusing on an unbiased approach with the possibility to capture unknown phenotypes, to, make, to perform novel discovery, things that we had not predicted uh, before the experiment. And we hope that the approach can cope with nonlinear relationships. And now it, we have good indications that this is the case. So the workflow flow and the schematics is the following. It's a multivariate image analysis. Um, and then we are using machine learning algorithms, for example, clustering and unsupervised learning in this case for finding different compound signatures um, that allows us to identify particularly phenotypes um, there are cellular phenotypes and are very complex phenotypes that we are looking at. Um, one of the most important parts is, as well is, of course, the data collection and the harmonization. And Philip has showed you that um, they have developed a, a, a package called Cobra that allows us then to take these data sets uh, um, in a way that we can then perform uh, feature engineering. So if, if you think about having a thousand, five, more than a thousand five hundred features, but then for your particular question, for your particular approach that you're testing, and we have different applications in, um, in the Institute, you want to select the most relevant ones that allowed you to uh, identify particular groups or clustering. And we are using 
um, a genetic algorithm-based feature selection for this approach. And I will show you details in the uh, next slides. And then, of course, once you have uh, performed your classification or clustering approach, you evaluate and validate your results and hope. And we have really now very good results, so we can perform compounds uh, or achieve compound signatures that are very distinct from each other, and also patient signatures that allows us to distinguish particular uh, phenotypes. And you start with the, the main question that you, you may ask yourself is, um, how do you select the most relevant features? Which features should you use to create a predictive model? This is an example of a correlation matrix of uh, mul mul uh, multiple features. And um, if you think about to use correlation for selecting the, the features, um, and you have to keep in mind that in biology, many features are correlated, you'll probably drop or um, eliminate many features only because they are correlated. Although we know that uh, these uh, features that are correlated may still be important um, when they are grouped together. And there is also non-linear effects of feature A and feature B being uh, by itself not in, uh, very important or not giving a very good prediction. But when you combine them together, they're very important and they may be correlated and you will do with many of the methods that uh, are at the moment available, you will not take into account these two factors. So we decided to use a different approach to tackle this challenge. So as I mentioned before, we're using a genetic algorithm based feature selection that has many advantage for our approach. It has better performance than traditional feature selection approaches. It can deal with many features. And so we have many, many features, a very long vector, more than 1,500 um, features. And we also have a lot of different conditions or patients, compounds, and it can deal with nonlinear effects. In theory, you need very limited domain knowledge because um, it, it's not important for this kind of algorithm to know exactly what it's selecting for. You just need to select a particular um, fitness uh, score that you want to uh, access. And you can use uh, state-of-the-art computer clusters in a parallelized fashion, which allows you to, to speed up the approach. So at the, at the core, this is uh, the principle is survival of the fittest. And I'm showing here a very simple example of having five features. And if you want to select the combination of two features um, that uh, allow you to, to, to perform a particular uh, task, let's say find a particular phenotype in your screen, um, how do you go about it? So the idea is that you start with all the features and then you perform a fitness assi assignment. You have to define what you consider good and bad. You select the features that work well together. You can perform additional um, um, uh, computational or uh, additional um, steps like crossover or mutations. You mean you combine different kinds of features together. And if you reach a particular stopping criteria, you stop this approach and you have selected your features. And if not, you can continue to do this for many iterations. So, so it's a little bit more clear. Um, if you have these five features, and you have different combinations, in this case, feature one and feature three, feature one and feature four, feature one and feature two, and let's say feature four and feature five, you can rank this uh, combination of feature together and select this so-called individual, these two individuals, these two combinations of features that work best for your approach and eliminate the other two and go on with your approach until you are satisfied, until you reach a particular criteria. And just as an overview, how much we could improve our deep phenotyping approach by using this uh, genetic algorithm-based feature selection. Um, the previous approach where we're using correlation-based feature selection, we had a score of around 0 0.5, maximum being one and the lowest being zero. And we have improved the performance by more than 45% in a very, very short period. Well, last year we had already a 0 0.7 um, so 70% of accuracy of, uh, of um, our prediction of finding the right phenotype. And with our optimized approach today, we achieve more than 95% accuracy um, in predicting particular phenotypes that we know are present in the data set. So if you select a particular kinds of features and you are looking for particular compounds, 
you can perform this so-called morphological profiling, and then you can start to learn what kind of signature will predict that you this compound or drug or condition, any treatment um, will be able to be positive, in this case, go into in vivo validation and clinical trials, but you can also understand what is not desired, what kind of signature you do not want to have, or even having toxic or non-specific effects. So as um, Eugenio has mentioned, we can de-risk at the very early stage any drug um, that you are testing. Here's an example of one of the applications we used, um, um, deep phenotyping for. Um, we knew that there were four phenotypes, A, B, C, and D, and you can appreciate that the signatures are very different uh, from each other, so we can detect that there are different phenotypes. In this case, only using 60 features from a total of more than 1,500, but the power of the approach also is revealed here, where with this resolution, we can find novel phenotypes, which we as a biologist have not predicted to be there. We were not able to identify with only a limited amount of features. We are currently testing the first applications with additional labels and additional data modalities can be integrated with this approach. And as um, Philip and Eugenio have mentioned to you, we have different applications where we are developing an approach that is general and is not specific to a particular question. But of course, we are focused on the central nervous system and on uh, dementia in this case. But you can think about this like a, a box of a database of features that can be used to make predictions for new specific conditions based on any previous label you may have. Or even if you only have partial labels, we can perform a, a, a novel discovery. And then you can select the kind of features that are important for your different applications, being pathology or disease, chemical structure, population stratification, as has been shown by Philip um, previously, molecular target, efficacy of drugs, and you can hint at the mechanism of action. And we believe that this is, this is the deep phenotyping is a valuable tool for different applications. And now we are inc incorporating new kinds of data sets and we are starting to see the new results that are very promising. So to conclude, compared to previous approach with only a limited amount of features, the deep phenotyping approach we're using identifies new clusters and even novel signatures. So novel discovery is possible at this resolution. So we are able to distinguish with accuracy all the known tested conditions, which validates our approach, but also we can pinpoint specific difference in compounds or patients. And we believe that this morphological profiling approach can unmask side effects by combining additional labels that are related to the known effects, for example, toxicity. There are some limitations and challenges you have to keep in mind, of course, when you're applying to such a, a high dimensional data and uh, this kind of approach. It requires high computational um, power and space resources. So it's costly in computational terms. And due to probabilistically result of what we're using uh, when we're using genetic uh, algorithms, it requires some experimental know-how and testing of different parameters. And it may take long time to converge since your results are stochastic. It means that sometimes in order to, to compute all this um, um, kind of metrics, it will take some time. But nowadays with state-of-the-art cluster analysis, uh, um, cluster um, hardware, and other kinds of approach we have in-house, we're able to speed up this approach. Of course, this is teamwork. So I would try to summarize um, here and also thank you for uh, participating today. And of course, Eugenio is mentoring all the projects that I'm sh we have showed you today. Um, the team um, that is uh, the data science team and particularly today Pranjal Dolo, which uh, was um, crucial for this kind of, for this project that I showed you today, but as well Mitilash and Nicholas and the complete LIT team where Philip is heading the, the, the team and there's many people in the background helping us and screening um, and preparing all the data sets so we can do the analysis. And of course, all the members of the core facilities and uh, group leaders at the DCI. I'd like to thank you as well. And um, I hope there are questions that we can uh, um, of course answer right away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you, Philip, um, very much for your these exciting um, presentations. Again, I was uh, able to learn a lot, uh, which I greatly appreciate, appreciate very much. And in fact, there are questions in the audience. Um, we have one question. I think this is going to do to you, Miguel, is coming from Yolanda Wenda. Hopefully, I pronounced it correctly. 
she is asking um, if your custom if you have customs plugins to sell profile and are they published and are you open to share the codes or deposit them in, at github and she, she also thanks you for your present impressive work yeah thank you very much thank you also for the question um so this custom plugins we develop are, are actually together are in part of the collaboration with the pharma company um so at the moment they are not open source they're not released to the community um but of course, whenever we can, we'll release such plugins to the community, but at the moment they are not, okay? And they have been developed particularly for this project and they are at the moment not available. Mm -hmm. There's another question I think is going to you, Eugenio from Takis Brinos. Uh, he also is impressed by your work um, you've presented today. And he is asking if they can access your image analysis pipeline for own images and uh, if you're open for collaboration. So going yes, to in principle, yes. Um, I mean, the, the core facility of the Zotini are accessible from everybody in the world. And um, we have an access, you can go log in on our website and see how to do this. Meaning that uh, as Miguel was mentioning, these image analysis are not uh, straightforward image analysis. So you, you need to tune a lot of parameters. You need to know your assay. So that's... Uh, uh, it, it is a project. It's not just pressing a button and uh, do the image analysis to get, not yet, it will come in the future probably, but at the moment is a uh, sort of prototyping and uh, it need to be embedded in the project. So if there is interesting, please drop me an email anytime and then we can, we can discuss about the different projects. Thank you. Um, Ursula Egra has a question. Um, can you comment on typical timelines of individual steps of the approaches? I can start and then the other can comment on this one. <laughs> uh, the, the assay development is the longest part and uh, the image and data analysis is also longer. The screen is fast. <laughs> That's normally once, once the screen is there, Philip is a different opinion, but if you compare the assay development from the bench scale to the full validated assay, it might take quite a longish time. And the, the data handling and analysis is also quite longer. So, but the screening is a normal procedure. When one is optimized and everything else, then uh, I have to say that we have also an excellent team. Uh, it is also very efficient in this, um, but the, the screening is, is not the bottleneck. The bottleneck are the assay and, uh, and the data analysis, in my opinion. But the other can comment differently. Maybe I can comment uh, also on this. So, of course, I totally agree uh, with you, Eugenio, uh, that the asset development part is really the majority. If you have success in this and you have set up an essay and it's robust uh, running on the automation, then, then of course. But um, the essay itself is a very complex uh, essay because uh, we are um, trying to, to, to collect a lot of different readouts during the whole innate immune response. It's not a classical uh, uh, endpoint readout because we are looking at different steps during the, the complete process. And this, of course, has an impact of of throughput, right? Uh, I mean, uh, with this essay, this essay was not uh, developed to, to screen uh, a couple of million compounds. Huh? So, I, I mean, in principle, it's doable, but I mean, it's expensive and very longish. Uh, that uh, was just my, my comment. It's a medium throughput essay, I would say so. And also the, the amount of data that we are producing is also limiting you know, when I, yeah, I mean, these are really terabytes of data that we are producing uh, from week to week. Okay. Yeah, so perhaps I can comment on the data analysis part. I mean, if it's if we have labels, meaning we are looking for a particular phenotype that we know is there, it's of course faster. But when we are doing something where we're looking for novel phenotypes, that's of course slow down. But as Philip mentioned, the data is huge and we have to handle it. Um, there are ways of uh, tackling this and we're working on this, of course, um, but it's still challenging. I mean, that's clear because we are extracting so many features and the 
just the transferring, saving, backing up all the, the approaches takes a while. Um, but yeah, it's still a bottleneck, yes. Mm -hmm. There's an additional question from the audience. If Atsuma Hara asks, I may have missed it, but what Salon do you use for your assets? Maybe I can comment. So there's not a cell line. These are primary cells that we isolated from human blood. These are PBMCs. These are mainly monocytes, T cells, and B cells, uh, and another cell types, but these are the majority. So it's a heterotypical cell model. It's not a monotypical cell line. We have different cells in it, and we analyze all of them uh, on a single cell level, image based. Philip, in addition to that, what approach do you use to secure your experiments so that the PBMCs do not detach from the problem of place? Since PBMCs are floating cells, I guess, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's tricky. Yeah, um, it's tricky. Yeah? But uh, nowadays, uh, with the kind of pipetters that we have, uh, uh, you can really precisely adjust uh, how to treat and how to handle these cells. And we have done this. I mean, uh, we, we have reference compound screens a hundred times, uh, and uh, we, we know that the cells are, are there. Now we, 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 we have, during the assay validation, done a lot of tests to uh, adjust uh, this pipetting uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. And if I may, uh, may add a question, Philip, about your high content image in Redia, why did you choose the Yokogawa device? It's special for your for your approach for your type of experiments you use, or are there other, have there been other reasons why you use this system? Um, it's not special. It's not dedicated to uh, the special uh, essay that we are doing. We are doing a lot of high content screening essays, a lot of different ones, and uh, there is a cell voyager from Yoko Garber provides all the different kind of technologies that we need also for all to cover all the other needs and in, in other projects but i think with the phoenix or other readouts you could do the same mm -hmm. yeah. miguel may i ask you a question how big are the amounts of data you have to work with on an ordinary experiment for instance okay so let's say for a particular application an experiment we're dealing with nine terabytes of data roughly nine mm -hmm. to ten okay. um, yeah. That is, of course includes many different conditions and controls that are in included in the data set. Mm -hmm. And Roughly. for your yeah, and for your for your AI approach, do you use computing units that are on site at your location in Bonn, or do you also use cloud services from other academic researchers or commercial providers? For Philip or for me? For you. For, Philip. Yeah. for me. Uh, yeah. Both. So we have in-house solutions. Um, um, we are very um, lucky that we also have um, particular partners that are specific partners with the detainee that uh, we have solutions, but we also are using other kinds of uh, resources on other institutes, um, mm -hmm. for example. Um, yeah. At the moment, not much kind of cloud computing, but maybe but, we'll yeah. come soon. Okay. Um, I see Takis Prinos is another question. Uh, he asked, have you done any image analysis with three-dimensional organoids? Or Organoids are notoriously difficult to analyze via traditional high content screening approaches. Yeah, so maybe Eugenie wants to comment here. Yeah, we, we, we did some experience with the organoids. Um, indeed, they are difficult uh, to do. Uh, it depends from the size of the organoids. So the, we produced actually Philip and the team was doing different dimension of the 3D organoids, actually more spheroids than organoids, I would say. Um, but they are challenging with the classical uh, image analysis. We develop another tool um, that is called the um, YAPIC. With this one, if you train it, this is a supervised image analysis based on deep learning. With this one, you can have a chance to analyze complex structure. So we use this one for histology or for other setup. Uh, and this is on GitLab. I think you find on GitHub or GitLab. So definitely. So this is something that is available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are no further questions. So thank you again to the presenters for these very exciting um, presentations again. Uh, it's been wonderful to listen to your 
uh, exciting data you have shown us here. And thank you also for the, to the audience for your interest, participation and the questions you've asked here. It was great to see how much interest there's still in this exciting technology. And I think this is still a, a wonderful technology to you in, in, in uh, medical research. And yeah, I wish everyone a pleasant day or a pleasant evening, wherever you are watching from us. Take care and thank goodbye. you.